fellow Trinity family, it's good to talk to you today, even if this isn't the way most of us would choose. Maybe you're sitting at your computer desk instead of in the choir loft today. Or maybe you're watching on your phone from the couch, coffee in hand, no judgment there. Maybe you're trying to find a moment of calm amid the chaos of children stuck in the house for too long already. Wherever you are today, physically, emotionally, spiritually, I am glad that you're here. I want to take a moment and chat about what my goal is for our time together in these coming weeks. I'm not going to try to recreate a normal Trinity worship service for you in my home office slash bedroom. For starters, the piano wouldn't fit. Instead, my hope is to share together in a time of reflection and prayer. I'll read some scripture, share some thoughts, and invite you to join in a time of prayer with me. I know for many of us, music is central to our worship. And so in the email I sent to our congregation and in the video description below, I've included some links to a few songs that I've been listening to this week, music that I found meaningful as I've reflected on the scripture for today and on what is going on in our world. I would invite you to take a listen. You may even find a new favorite. Friends, as we enter into a time of worship and reflection, I invite you to pause for a moment, wherever you find yourself, and lay aside the weight of the past few days. Even if it's only for these few minutes that we have together, allow your burdens to rest. Before we pray, I would encourage you to envision, <clears throat> as clearly as you are able, your spot in the sanctuary. Who's sitting nearby? Is it family, friends, same people every week, new visitors? Whoever your mind went to first, can I ask you to hold them especially in prayer this day? Friends, let's pray together. Holy God, why is it that we look but do not see? Bring us again and again into your light, until your ways become visible to us and bear fruit in us. Touch us so that we are utterly changed of before and after and now and then, so that we may also say one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. In Christ's light we pray. Amen. Today's reading comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. This passage leads into the well-known dialogue where Jesus calls himself the Good Shepherd. Listen for God's word to you on this day. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man, but they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? The man said, I do not know. 
they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and that he received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. The man answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to the one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began. Has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind? If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and you are trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I come into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees heard him say this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin, but now that you say we see, your sin remains. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a lot in this passage, and so I want to break the fourth wall for a moment and remind you that you can jump back and listen to some or all of the scripture passage again if it would be helpful. I'll be right here waiting when you're ready. Of course, not only is this a longer passage than we sometimes read together in worship, it also raises a lot of issues. What are we to do with the idea that sin is or could be multi-generational punishment? And just when we think Jesus has gotten us out of that theological mess, he goes and seems to say that God planned for this man to be born blind just so that Jesus could make a tidy example a few decades later. Add on top of that the fact of the text seeming to view this man 
as nothing more than his sightedness or lack thereof. After all, his neighbors don't even know what to call him without his blindness as an identifier. This text is a theological and preaching minefield before we even get to the way his parents act. I don't want to dash your hopes, but I'm not going to unpack each of those issues today. I think it's important for us to name the tensions we feel in Scripture, not because we need to solve them before we can understand a passage, but before because so often we need to be freed of our distractions long enough to look past them to where God is. By saying, this part is hard for me, we give ourselves the freedom to set it aside for a moment and ask, but I wonder what else is here. So I've been left wondering what it was like for this man to encounter Jesus. The first thing I notice as I let my mind travel down this pathway of wondering is this. The man never asks to be healed. You know, in some other healing narratives in the gospel, the individual hears that Jesus is coming and they call out to him. But in this case, the man is minding his own business when this random rabbi makes some mud with his spit and spreads it on his eyes and tells him to go wash his face. His encounter with Jesus is not part of his plan. Jesus just happens to the man. I also notice we are told that Jesus is walking along and sees the man, and not just in a, hey, look, there's a guy on the side of the road kind of a way, but in a way so authentic that when the disciples ask him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? Jesus doesn't dive into a theological discussion of sin. He tells his followers, look, you have it all wrong. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. You see, Jesus knows the man's story. The real trouble for the man is what happens after he is healed. Remember, this is a 41-verse narrative. The man is healed by the end of verse 7. The lesson is in what happens next. I notice that when the man is healed, his relationships are upended so much so that his neighbors doubt he is even the same person. Even as he repeats to them, I am the man, they keep doubting him. Meeting Jesus might have healed his blindness, but it doesn't make sense to those around him. So they question everything he says, even down to his own identity. They doubt the man so much they drag him in front of the Pharisees, the strict religious elites of the day, to try and get some answers. What follows is some of the best dialogue in Scripture, in my humble opinion. As the man tells his story over and over, I notice that what starts as him telling the facts of what happened, put mud on my eyes, I wash, now I see, transforms into this man testifying that Jesus is a prophet. When he tells others about his encounter with Jesus, regardless of if they believe it or not, it helps clarify how he understands his own encounter with Christ. As the man's discussion with the Pharisees continues, especially after his parents turn tail out of fear, the man shows no fear of the leaders, but remains grounded in what he knows to be true. I was blind, but now I see. Now, as a side note, if that line feels familiar, it's because you sing it at the end of the first verse of Amazing Grace. This is one of the scriptures that inspired the writing of the hymn. The man's boldness, however, wins him no favors, and he is driven out of the synagogue. Encountering Christ may have transformed the man, but not those around him. The final thing I notice as I wonder about the man's experience of meeting Jesus, is this. After the man is doubted by his neighbors, abandoned by his parents, and driven from the synagogue, Jesus finds him. 
Jesus searches him out. You see, encountering Christ isn't a one-time thing for the man. Jesus comes looking for him. I wonder if this man's experience might be a little like your experience or mine. I wonder if sometimes our experiences of Christ aren't part of the plan, if sometimes Jesus happens to us as much as anything. I wonder if the more we think we know the plan of life, the way things are going to go, the more likely Jesus is to show up and wipe a little mud in our eyes and tell us to get ourselves cleaned up. I wonder if we always trust that Jesus knows our story. Not the sanitized, social media-friendly, Christmas letter-ready version of our story, you know the version I'm talking about, where nothing bad happens unless it has a happy ending all ready to share and where the kids are always perfect and never exhausting. But our actual story? I wonder if we trust that Jesus knows our actual story and loves us all the same. I wonder if our encounter with Christ sometimes is so transformational in our lives that those around us don't recognize who we are anymore. And I wonder if I'm okay with that. I wonder if I sometimes shy away from telling my story because I'm afraid of what people might think or what they might say. I fear they might think I've lost it a little bit. Fear my friends might say, I hardly recognize you anymore. I wonder if we tell others about our encounter with Jesus often enough that we learn more each time we tell it. I wonder if the words of that old hymn are true for us. Do we love to tell the story? I wonder if we are ready for Jesus to come looking for us, ready when he asks, do you believe? Maybe times like we're living in now, when the whole world feels upside down, Maybe it makes me wonder a bit more. But I know a few things for sure. I know that Christ is the judge of the world, none other. I know that Christ walks the road to Jerusalem not to claim a throne or power, but to demonstrate his love for you and for me and all those that he's come to judge. I also know that in these days of uncertainty and fear, we are called to be people of hope. I think it's telling that the psalm and the lectionary for today is Psalm 23. And that, my friends, will be our closing prayer. So even if you feel right now as if we're in the midst of a dark valley, my prayer is that you would fear no evil. Would you join me in prayer? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Amen. I hope you found this time together to be hope-filled and centering for the week ahead. Also attached to this email are some links to songs that have been sustaining me this past week, including a great version of Psalm 23 by Keith and Kristen Getty. I've also included some daily devotions. I would love to get your feedback about how this first extended worship service was for you. Drop me a note by email or comment right here on the video page, whatever is easiest for you. So my friends, until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm.